Welcome back to Kenyon, Professor Joseph Proxy, Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Chicago. His topic this evening is Plato on Socrates by way of Parmenides. He'll be happy to take questions following his talk, and you're also welcome to speak further with him at our reception in the lobby. Professor Proxy's published essay International Relations and Reflections on America. It has been rightly said of his essays that they are equivalent to other scholars' books. So when he actually writes a book, look out. Think Magnum Opus. Plato's World, Man's Place in the Cosmos, has just been published by the University of Chicago Press and is currently available in a bookstore. In his interpretation of seven related Platonic dialogues, Professor Proxy discusses the character of Plato's body soul, and specifically how Plato links thinking about the universe to political and moral concern. I, for one, am prepared to find that the lifelong thought expressed in this book is going to make magnum opus seem too small to phrase. Here in the heart of my introduction, or I might be long-winded, or in fact I have been long-winded in the past, I'm going to be brief on the principle that a wit or a pretense is there to, uh, to vacate the scene with dispatch when wisdom is in the room. I'll just add three things. First, during the public affairs conference here a long time ago, when Mr. Proxy was commenting on a paper written by Jean Patrick, quoted one of her lines, which I've actually associated with him ever since. There's no substitute for knowing what you're talking about. Second, in honor of the 25th anniversary of women students at Kenyon, it was my privilege to introduce the person who was for me the exemplar of student. Tonight, I am honored to introduce the person who is for me the exemplar of teacher. I have found myself on more than one occasion during this anniversary year reflecting on my own lucky breaks as a student. For the record, I think Mr. Proxy's mode of teaching says 87.5% of what needs to be said about co-education at the University of Chicago. Third, I never knew a student of Mr. Proxy's, man or woman, who did not agree with Aristotle's point that philosophy begins it's just that Aristotle seems to have had looking up in mind, whereas we had casting a glance to the front of the classroom. Those are just the Everybody knows about Aristotle, and 
sometimes people know about Pythagoras and they've heard about him. Uh, they've heard of Protagoras. Unfortunately, these people's names begin to sound similar. Uh, occasionally, people have heard about Parmenides. And then there is a, there's really a surprisingly large number of eminent men about whom most people know nothing. And even the experts cannot know very much because their work exists in the form of what are called fragments. So there is Heraclitus, and there is Democritus, and there is Anaximenes, and Anaxagoras. Uh, there, are, there are many. <coughs> and their works are literally fragmentary. It is as if Shakespeare were to be known, let's say, 3,000 years from now, only through quotations that exist in other people's work who happen to choose a passage or something or other from one or more of his plays. <coughs> well, uh, Parmenides, now those people were really uh, very respectable. And the people who were closer to them in time and who thought about them and wrote about them and quoted them and argued with them <clears throat> were, of course, very much impressed by them. But one very important source of knowledge about these people who are called pre-Socratics is Aristotle. <clears throat> Aristotle was close to them in time. And I don't have to praise his intelligence in front of this audience. <clears throat> he has a lot to say about these people. About Parmenides, a lot. About Pythagoras, a lot. <clears throat> and much of this, interestingly enough, turns up, and I'll have to dwell on the meaning of this, <clears throat> in the book called Physica, the Physics, and in the other one called the Metaphysics. Uh, now, Parmenides is the pre-Socratic of whose writing more survives, admittedly, and uh, of course in fragmentary form, but in significant fragments, more survives <clears throat> than of any other single pre-Socratic. And the entire bulk of the surviving Parmenidean material <clears throat> amounts to no more than, say, I don't know, six pages or something uh, along that line, depending on where the book is printed. Uh, Parmenides was born <clears throat> around 515. There are two ways of calculating his age. <clears throat> One of them more reliable than the other, and there's no point going into this. Uh, the more reliable <clears throat> puts him at about 515 B.C. <clears throat> Socrates was born at, let's say, to make the figures round, at 470 B.C. <clears throat> so Parmenides was about 45 years older than Socrates. <clears throat> what, uh, what these pre-Socratic philosophers share and how they come down to us and are known to us <clears throat> is, I think it's fair to say, uh, accessible through their preoccupation with one single but universal subject, which is to say, <clears throat> what is the whole? What is the whole? What constitutes it? What accounts for it? <clears throat> and I think, again, it's fair to say, what is more absolutely explanatory of the whole than any other single thing? We <clears throat> might translate that into the form of the expression. What is the principle of the whole? What is the principle of the universe? Of the universe? Meaning by principle something rather technical, namely, that behind which or beyond which you cannot go in order to render the complexity of the whole intelligible. Now you could say <clears throat> that, that 
intelligent, uh, curious observer of the of the entirety of the human beings, of the animal world, of the whole natural world, of the the lights in the heavens. <coughs> A curious and intelligent observer of all of that might, above all things, ask himself, what is it that can possibly help us to make sense out of what presents itself as a, a, an, an incomprehensible multiplicity? The first thing, apparently, that struck the minds of these organized observers was the multiplicity, the plurality, of the observable. <clears throat> and the task, apparently, became this. To what can that multiplicity be reduced so that it becomes encompassable by a human mind? What, in other words, is the principle of the whole? <laughs> what renders it intelligible? <clears throat> and what is it to which that manifold can be reduced? <clears throat> now, I think uh, probably everybody is aware that there was an ancient uh, kind of physics which affirmed that there are four irreducible elements, fire, air, and water, you know, that <clears throat> whole story, and earth to uh, round it out. As if, when you have considered the multiplicity of the variety of the whole perceptible world and recognized that it consists uniformly of the same small number of ingredients, you have done what you could to make it, quote unquote, intelligible. Now, a certain price has to be paid for that mode of reduction or reductionism. Because if you were to say that the multiplicity of the world, the manifold of the world, is made intelligible by reference to earth and air and fire and water, you would, of course, be saying that the explanation of the whole is its reduction to matter, to forms of matter, to kinds of matter. And that was indeed <clears throat> and early enough, uh, pre-Socratic mode of reasoning. So, <clears throat> the first, <coughs> or if not at least, if not the first, then at least the fewest, see both first and fewest with a kind of, with a, with a capital F, where it would be the elementary for the out of which, the out of which, as one might say, a primitive explanation of the multiplicity of the whole is the out of which. <coughs> now, it doesn't take, uh, well, I don't know. I was about to say it doesn't take a whole lot of reflection, but then on the other hand, it could, it could take a whole lot of reflection to arrive at the conclusion that out of which is not uh, necessarily the explanation of a manifold. It might not be the explanation of anything. It may be that more important than the out of which, as explanatory, is the toward which, or those of you who know Greek, Henekahu, for the sake of which, or what came to be called more, 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 uh, more elegantly, the final cause, that towards which. I mean, you do understand the manifold of a house better if you understand what it's for, than if you only understand what it's made of. Well, this thought uh, <coughs> uh, certainly uh, came to people. Now, I would mention to you that the notion that the world is explained <coughs> by the out of which, for its components, is by no means obsolete. And if you think of chemistry, uh, well, advanced chemistry in its modern form, <clears throat> or uh, for that matter in its primitive form. Or you, you think, think of, uh, of metaphysics and physics, <clears throat> uh, you will surely be aware that there, biology is still is a very strong impulse 
to explain an entirety in terms of the the composite, the, the composite in terms of the uh, the element. Uh, who needs to be told that particle physics could make a claim to be the science, but more primarily attaches attacks the question of uh, the nature of the world than, than any other thing. Now, <clears throat> this much by way of uh, setting up the stage. The Parmenides, the Parmenides, the dialogue, <clears throat> is, a, uh, is a demonstration of how to attack the question of what is primary, what is absolutely primary. Meaning by primary, that which can explain what is deducible from it, but that which cannot be explained in terms of anything that is prior to it. It has the character of an axiom or a, a, a primary premise in a, in a science or in a syllogism, let's say, where there is no way to say more exactly what the premise means than by reference to the premise itself. If you have discovered what is primary, you have discovered that which is capable of explaining what follows from it, but is incapable of being explained by anything from which it follows. Now, the Parmenides dialogue has a peculiar character, and I'll try to uh, <coughs> say a little more about this uh, right now, but I would propose to you that one, if not the whole animus of a large part of that dialogue is to show how to investigate the question of the primary. What is the primary? And I mean that in a very solemn sense. Primary with regard to the entire constitution of the universe altogether. <clears throat> now before getting to that, let me tell you a little bit about the dialogue itself and how it uh, how it is set up and how it moves. There is a, a character called Kephalus. <clears throat> and as soon as I say Kephalus, everybody's antenna will go up, and you're thinking of uh, the old man in the Republic. Now your antenna will go further up when you realize that immediately after the introduction of Kephalus, Glaucon uh, and Adamantus, two characters, are uh, also introduced. And by then, you're sure that you're hearing some kind of uh, epilogue to the Republic or prologue to it, or somehow or other, uh, those characters are being talked. But I have to tell you that Plato makes it pretty clear that the Kephalus that he's talking about <clears throat> is not the Kephalus of the Republic, and there's no particular reason for thinking that the two others are the same characters as I mentioned there. But, but at any rate, you, you are put in mind of the Republic for a reason that I must say remains uh, mysterious almost to the end of the dialogue. Now what happens is, Kephalus is the one who's telling the story. Uh, when you open the Parmenides, the first thing you see is something said by Kephalus describing how the rest of the conversation came to be, this, uh, came to be uh, reported. It's a, it's a longish kind of thing. The upshot of it is <clears throat> Kephalus has to go and find somebody who can relate the whole conversation that took place between Parmenides Socrates and another character called Aristotle. Not the Aristotle that one thinks about, but, but a different one who had a bad fate because we're told he became a member of the 30 tyrants and they did not prosper. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, to be brief about it, there was a person who was at the conversation where Parmenides presided, was in contact with Socrates, and conducted the conversation with Aristotle. There was a person who was there, his name was Pythodorus. That Pythodorus 
related the entire conversation to a man named Antiphon. Antiphon is the one whom Epilus had to go to Athens from Plesamini to meet because Epilus wanted to know what happened at that conversation, which he wanted to know. He had to go to somebody who knew what happened, and it's this Antiphon who tells it to him. <clears throat> he memorized it. Now I'm bothering you with these details for the following reason. <clears throat> when they go and find Antiphon, he is described as being in consultation with a blacksmith who is uh, executing orders for a, for a horse bridle or something like that, some horse apparatus. Antiphon, having uh, found a life for himself by going back to the farm, and he's now, uh, that's what he does. He, uh, he remembers this dialogue, but it's, he's got nothing more to do with it, <clears throat> with that whole activity. I think that Plato has planted Antiphon <clears throat> right there at the beginning of the dialogue <clears throat> for a certain purpose. And I think that he has planted Aristotle there too <clears throat> for the same purpose. Those two are people who early gave up on the study of philosophy as they had it from Parmenides and Zeno, the principal pupil of Parmenides. They gave up on it, <clears throat> and they went about some other business. And I think I even can guess why they did that. Because the more that they listened to Parmenides <clears throat> and to Zeno, this is not the Zeno the Stoic, this is Zeno, the author of paradoxes, like if a turtle starts out ahead of a rabbit, <clears throat> the rabbit will never catch the turtle because uh, the rabbit can only divide the distance between itself and the turtle by half, and what you have is a, an infinitely diminishing series. There's a simple formula for resolving the limit of that, which doesn't occur. And therefore, <clears throat> the rabbit will never overtake the tortoise turtle. See, by the way, Aristotle in one paragraph explodes that. I mean, he shows, he doesn't only say, you know it will, but he also tells you why, but we can't do it today. <clears throat> uh, Antiphons, let me put it this way, got fed up with the paradoxes of Zeno and the sophistications of Parmenides. And I have to tell you this too, in a certain place in Aristotle's physics, he denounces Parmenides as a, uh, a, a contentious arguer, heuristic, <clears throat> and mistaken, arguing from false premises. So you have to understand that there is a certain position from which the arguments and the uh, enterprise of Parmenides were highly questionable and were rejected by so intelligent a person as Aristotle. Nevertheless, Parmenides was a man of very considerable reputation among the, uh, <coughs> the people of his time, and, and, and surely for Plato, and, and we question the answer as that's not why. And I think that the answer to that is probably this. Parmenides was searching for the thing that was worth searching for. But he did it in a way that had to be, in a very important respect, rejected. Now, at this point, <clears throat> let me uh, turn more directly to the way in which the argument progresses. And the purpose of Parmenides becomes divulged. <clears throat> Early in the dialogue, uh, Socrates arrives a little bit late. Socrates is described as very young, which is meant to take to be about 20. He arrives at a certain place where Zeno is reading a paper of his. It turns out to be an old paper, one that he wrote a long time ago. But anyhow, people had asked him to say what his thoughts were and so forth. So he reads this paper. The burden of the paper is <clears throat> all capital A cannot be many. All cannot be many. Now that sounds as if what it means is 
when you look at the totality, you look at the, the whole, the universe, it cannot be a plurality. Now that seems like the most arrant nonsense that anybody could have come. The problem for these thinkers was exactly that the whole presents itself as an, as an enormous plurality. <clears throat> it looks like all the many. Now Zeno uh, points directly to the core of the Parmenidean project when he says, all cannot be many. <clears throat> that is to say, not many, one. Therefore, all is one. <clears throat> now, Socrates exactly taxes Zeno with having said, in effect, that all is one. And what he criticizes Zeno for is simply having repeated the famous doctrine of Parmenides, which is all is one, and converted it into the proposition all cannot be met. Well, uh, uh, Socrates not only points out that this is simply an example of a, uh, a conversion of one locution into another, but he, Socrates, replies with an affirmative suggestion. <clears throat> and what he does, he, Socrates, does, is to present his doctrine of the ideas, the famous doctrine of the ideas. I'll explain this in a minute. <clears throat> but first I want to tell you that the subtitle of this dialogue of Parmenides is On the Ideas. That subtitle was not given it by Plato. The subtitles of the Platonic uh, dialogues were given to them by uh, various redactors and uh, commentators along the way <clears throat> uh, who, uh, for very good reasons, uh, uh, expressed what they understood to be the true import or direction of the dialogue. Now, that has to be taken seriously. <clears throat> And I must tell you that there are commentators on the uh, on the Parmenides, which is a notoriously puzzling piece of work. There are commentators who do begin with the thought that the, uh, the purpose of the dialogue is to criticize the Socratic doctrine of the ideas. And they have a good reason for starting out that way. Because when Socrates begins by presenting his notion about the ideas, there is a substantial passage in which uh, Parmenides takes him on and indicates to him what he, Parmenides, thinks are the objections to the doctrine of the ideas. Now, what is the doctrine of the ideas? Uh, we see that there are uh, many things that are beautiful. We call them beautiful. There are many things that we think are true. There are many things or actions that we think are just. <clears throat> there are many things that we say are good. What gives us the right to say that something is beautiful, something else is beautiful, a day is beautiful, a dog is beautiful, a human being is beautiful, a painting is beautiful, a poem is beautiful. These things seem to have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with one another. But yet somehow, we are entitled <clears throat> to call them all by the same name. And not only that, but we understand one another. And so it goes with uh, such categories as good and just, true, some other things. That's a way of collecting a many and explaining them by reference to a one. And everybody knows that Socrates' official doctrine of the ideas is one way or another a, uh, a, a, is a, a solution to the problem of the so-called many and one. See, the one idea covering, encompassing the many individuals under it, which get their name or their qualification from that one. Now that puts Socrates' doctrine straight in the line of all of those pre-Socratic and other uh, projects for rendering a multiplicity intelligible by reduction. 
by reduction to a smaller number, and in the best case, a reduction of a many to a one. Now you begin to see <clears throat> perhaps the ground on which Parmenides might launch his critique of the Socratic doctrine of the ideas. If you recur to the proposition attributed to Parmenides without contradiction by Socrates, namely, all is one. Maybe there is a reason to criticize Socrates' uh, doctrine of the ideas because although it pretends and to some extent succeeds in reducing a multiplicity to a unity, what it does is it produces a number of unities. It produces the idea of this, the idea of that, the idea of the other, and you have not uh, succeeded in rendering the multiplicity as a unity with uh, perfect success. <clears throat> now, the way in which uh, Parmenides attacks the doctrine of ideas is not in this straightforward manner that I've just now summarized for you. But what he does is to make trouble for Socrates uh, by posing this question. I mean, this is, this is one of the ways in which Parmenides makes trouble. He says, what more exactly do you mean by this participation? What is the nature of the relation between the individual concrete ones down below, the objects, and the idea which covers them all? What exactly is that relation? <clears throat> Are you saying that, for example, the idea of beauty is somehow chopped up and exists as a residue in the various things that are beautiful. Can you say that and at the same time <coughs> that the idea of beauty or any idea is really truly a one? Does it find its way into all of those things in such a way that you come away with the certain impression that the idea is a thing capable of being divided and uh, in location actually <clears throat> you would say you socrates that the idea of beauty is up up somewhere well what about the beautiful things so one problem is the idea if it is thought of in this way breaks down and turns out to be a contradiction of itself if it can be divided in that many, <coughs> many ways, it's not really, truly, and primarily a one, and therefore it's not primarily explanatory. <clears throat> now there is a, another difficulty, which as a matter of fact has even greater consequences, I think, of a, in, in a very long run, <clears throat> and that's this. Do Socrates believe, do you not, that those, uh, those ideas are in the realm of the intelligible. They are in a class by themselves, a class of intelligibles. Down here, the things that they are supposed to explain or, or uh, inspire, <clears throat> those things are in the realm of the empirical, that which can be observed and experienced. In fact, the whole project exists for the sake of making the purely really empirical intelligible. Now, have you not posited two realms, the relation between which you are incapable of explaining? Because you cannot be clear, you have not been clear and you cannot be clear, on the exact means by which the concrete objects participate in the ideas from which they get their name and the, from which they get their character. You cannot explain that. And I will tell you further, Socrates, that it's the divine things that live up there aloft in the realm of the intelligible. And it's only the human beings who live on the dimension or on the plane of the concrete and the perceptible. And when you make the relation between those two realms as incomprehensible, when you make the gap between them as 
uncrossable as you have made them, you have in effect said that the gods can have no knowledge of the human things. They have only knowledge of the intelligible things. See? And we, which might be even might be less disastrous, can <coughs> have no knowledge of that. But that the gods live on the level of the intelligible, of the eternal things, the immortal things, and are therefore out of contact with us because we live in our on a dimension which is simply alien to their being. You have done something, the consequences of which you would consider. <coughs> well, <coughs> now, Socrates uh, has to take these, <coughs> uh, these things uh, seriously. <coughs> it goes without saying. Now, <coughs> there, is, there is one further aspect of the, uh, the critique of the ideas, <coughs> of the doctrine of the ideas by Parmenides, which afflicts Socrates, and it, uh, it causes a problem for the reader as well. <coughs> Parmenides says to him, of what kinds of things, or of what things, are there ideas? And uh, <coughs> are there ideas of true and beautiful and good, and so forth? <coughs> Socrates, uh, Socrates is unequivocal, yes there are. Is there an idea of man? <clears throat> Socrates says, I've never been able to understand. I don't know. <clears throat> I wonder about that. <clears throat> Parmenides goes on and says, what about uh, such things as mud <clears throat> and nails and hair <clears throat> and things of that kind? Uh, other ideas of those things? Socrates says, absolutely not. <clears throat> and then, Parmenides says to him, young man, you show great promise. And it's very good that you concentrate your mind so much on the intelligible as distinct from and superior to the merely observable, <coughs> the empirical. And that's good. He said, but you are under the influence of opinion still. You are not yet philosophic. You have a great promise in philosophy. I can tell you that. And there's a little scene between Parmenides and Zeno, in which they smile at each other after Socrates has presented his doctrine. And a bystander thinks that they're laughing at him, it turns out not at all. They're admiring him. <clears throat> they really truly do, apparently. And think he's, uh, he's very wise to be doing that, namely, to try to ascend above the merely empirical to the conceivable means not imaginable, but purely conceivable. So that's fine. But now the question, of what things are their ideas? Socrates will not admit that there are ideas of the base things, of the merely ignoble things. And here is where Parmenides <coughs> discloses something that I think is going to have a reverberation <coughs> through to the end of the dialogue, namely this. Parmenides is a reductionist in the most radical sense. When he sets out to give a single explanation of all, absolutely all, he has to find some one thing, some one thing to which everything else can be reduced for explanation, but which itself, of course, cannot be reduced to anything else for explanation. <clears throat> the thing that Parmenides is famous for having resorted to as the absolutely primary explanatory of all things is one. <clears throat> O-N-E. One. The, uh, the dialogue becomes very difficult because at so many points <clears throat> you wish that instead of saying one, he would have said something like unity uh, as a characteristic. <clears throat> he mostly does not do that. It's simply called N, which just means one in the masculine singular. <clears throat> now, what I meant by 
uh, uh, contrasting the uh, project of Parmenides with his critique of the Socratic plurality of the ones is the following. When Socrates hears what Parmenides has to say about his Socrates being under the influence of popular opinions, see, not being really philosophic, in that he, Socrates, won't elevate more than nails and hair and face things to the <coughs> dignity of having a supervening idea of them. When he does that, he breaks the rule, which is the tacit rule of Parmenides, that there is one, and I'll let me say one thing, there is one thing or one explanation which accounts for all. Socrates' position apparently is, and he says this, he says sometimes I'm afraid that the same rule is going to have to cover everything. See? <clears throat> In the light of what he has just now said about the ideas, it becomes perfectly clear that Socrates makes what we could call a moral <coughs> distinction. He makes a distinction between the base and the noble. <coughs> and the noble. And he will not at least enunciate whether he has contemplated and whether he has discovered is another thing. But he will not enunciate one doctrine that accounts for the ignoble and the noble, the noble and the base alike. He apparently insists on reserving to the noble a higher principle of explanation that would account for and explain the ignoble things or the morally neutral things. Now, why he would do that is a, uh, uh, is a very important question. <clears throat> I would propose to you that the reason that uh, Socrates maintains the position that he does in this regard is if the human beings <clears throat> do not resort to an explanation of the whole, recognizes at the most fundamental level the difference between noble and base. They will have so jeopardized their position in the world that there will be no recovery for them. Now what I mean by that is something like this. In modern terms, if one were to say that there is no principle for explaining the things in the heavens and below the earth and on the surface of it. No principle except the principle of molecular physics or subatomic particles, particle physics. If one were to say that, I think it is obvious that somebody would say, but what about the difference between good and evil, uh, <clears throat> between decent and indecent, between fair and unfair? How do you explain those? in terms of this one solitary, unitary principle, which indeed explains a great deal, but you have to understand that that does not explain all. I think if one had to put the, the difference between Parmenides and Socrates uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a formula, it would be that whether Parmenides is right or wrong about whether he has discovered the primary cause of all, <clears throat> his project and his proposed solution are faulty in that they do not take account of the human situation. They do not take account of the peculiar human problem, <clears throat> the problem of human beings finding their orientation in a world in which the simply natural principles of, uh, let's say, physics <clears throat> do not suffice. I think that that, that I would simply propose to you <clears throat> the, uh, this as a, as a hypothesis for making your way uh, through the dialogue. Now, <clears throat> uh, this uh, ultimate, uh, absolute ultimate 
uh, reduction of all things uh, to one. I could uh, illustrate, but the time is getting short. There, there is a, a passage in Parmenides' poem. Well, uh, let me tell you this little thing so you can uh, go on and do some of this for yourself. There are enough, as I said, there are enough fragments of Parmenides' work, which is in the form of a poem, <clears throat> enough fragments, so that one can really uh, get something like the drift of this general purpose. The, the, the fragments are maybe sometimes 20 lines long, sometimes only six and eight and things like that. And, and it is so hard to, uh, to get a, a grasp on them as a whole that different redactors have arranged them in different orders. But that's all right. And now there are passages in there which would be very uh, illuminating to read. And uh, they, they have to be short because they're probably going to read to you. But, uh, it, it's just out of the question. But uh, I'll give you a sample. <clears throat> <clears throat> what can be thought, this is Parmenides' poem, what can be thought is only the thought that it is. <clears throat> but you will not find thought without what is. But thinking is the thought that it is. You begin to see the reason why people have a lot of trouble uh, understanding what's going on here, but I, I, I think you want to endure this for just a minute. For you will not find thought without what is, in relation to which it is uttered. For there is not, nor shall be, anything else besides what is, since fate fettered it to be entire and immovable. Wherefore, all these are mere names which mortals may lay down, believing them to be true, namely, coming into being and perishing, being and not being, both at once, change of place and variation of bright color. This is a little discourse on the uh, unintelligibility of the world as we have it, as it is an object of our experience and perception why it needs to be transcended by something, and at best some one thing, which explains all of it. And this is what he finds objectionable in Socrates' account. It does not do that. It persists in these, what are called, immiscible ideas, the ideas that cannot mix with one another. There's a lot in Plato about what can mix and what cannot mix, and much in Aristotle, but what is miscible with what? Of all things that are immiscible, the ideas stand as the whole time uh, exemplar. <clears throat> one is the absolutely primary, and as the dialogue develops, you are led to understand <clears throat> that when you begin to make predications of one, when you start to say one is this and one is that, one is the same, one is not the same, one is the same as other, one is other than other, when you begin to make predications or attribute things, qualities, characteristics to the one, <clears throat> you will find that you end up in contradiction. The Parmenides dialogue is a, it's a burden on the heart. It's a tribulation because you read that and you, you, you just have to sympathize with that default. I mean, there is a very strong temptation drop this whole thing as being just idle chatter and sophistry at its worst. And I must say that Aristotle shared somewhat in the opinion that uh, Parmenides was, as I said, contentious. That's a quote from him. From him. It's, it's, in, in addition to being wrong, I mean, that his reason for contentious be uh, paradoxical. Now, I think, and it takes a courageous person to uh, uh, have a doubt about Aristotle's judgment on anything but surely on this. I think that might not be quite fair to Parmenides, <clears throat> uh, who after all did have the respect, I believe, of Plato. I think that there is a very serious point in uh, Parmenides proceeding in such a way that the more he attributes characteristics <clears throat> to Epon uh, things that before, that, that happened to uh, uh, the one, the more he does that, the 
more he winds up within possibilities and within possibilities that he contradicts flatly in a later part of the dialogue with other impossibilities that are just for the, uh, for the opposite. What he says, one is the absolutely primary and susceptible to predication, <clears throat> and without one there would be nothing. That is to say, without unity, there would be no number. It's quite true, there couldn't be numbers if there were not one. There wouldn't be speech, because without one, all would be in flux. If there were not the stable one that unites, that gives a unity, a oneness to the whole, there would be no way for us to say anything to one another or to give names to anything. And there would not, in, on another dimension, even be things. If there were not one, if there were not unity, nothing would stick together long enough for there to be objects. There wouldn't be things. I think, subject to correction, but I, <clears throat> I think that what Parmenides has in mind is that one is explanatory, not only on the, on the plane of the concepts, but also, ultimately, it absorbs the doctrine of other uh, pre-Socratics to the effect that all is love. <clears throat> the the pre-Socratic who announced that all is love meant by that it's pretty obvious that there is a principle of attraction that keeps things together. Love means attraction coming together. And if there were not that coming together, there wouldn't be a solar system, there wouldn't be a flea, there wouldn't be anything. There would be no things if nothing stayed together. Big question, what is it that stays together? <clears throat> and that will get you into the question of the atoms, and that's too much for us for the classification. Now, our entity's project really, it seems to me, is to account for all by reference to one. <clears throat> it cannot be referred to anything prior to itself from which it can be derived. His conclusion at the end of the, uh, uh, of the dialogue is, <clears throat> if one is not, nothing is. He is, uh, he is not persuaded. We might say the whole is explained by what cannot itself be explained. Now, I've got to tell you <clears throat> that uh, a way of uh, interpreting <clears throat> Parmenides is to uh, uh, interpret him as a, as a theology. <clears throat> I, I tell you for sure, no matter how confused you get in reading this dialogue, <clears throat> one thing is really very likely to strike you. The emphasis on one and for our help, the one is always with a capital O. The, the drumbeat reference to the one is sure to remind somebody sooner or later of the one God. <clears throat> and it, it is, it's not hard to, uh, to conjecture that when Parmenides is on the track of that which accounts for all, that's one. And that one cannot be explained by reference to any other thing. And you cannot even safely attribute being to it, <clears throat> because once you attribute being to it, you raise the question of whether one and being are two. And if they're equally uh, primordial, then you have not reduced the whole to one. It's dangerous, in other words, even if you try to reduce uh, uh, the one to the characteristic of being. <clears throat> that one which cannot be referred to anything else from which it can be derived. If the one is not, nothing is. Now I ask you if it wouldn't be possible to replace the word, the three letter word one, with the three letter word God. <clears throat> and people have noticed this. Uh, I mean, you would notice it if you read the dialogue, maybe not once, but a few times already. It really would come to you. <clears throat> Well, uh, that, uh, that prompts a few interesting questions. Now, at this point, there is something that I'd like to read to you. Uh, I'll find it. It's definitely
eventually, but not right away, he wrote this. And I'm not going to read this whole thing a lot, but this has a, a chapter. Well, I'll read you the chapter heading. The essence of God and his attributes <clears throat> are identical. <clears throat> it is known that existence is an accident. You know, this is a, in a technical sense, that it is an accident being something that is attributed to something else which is substantive. See, there is a, an underlying, and to it you can imagine things being stuck, which are its attributes or accidents. <clears throat> <clears throat> it is known that existence is an accident appertaining to all things and therefore an element superadded to their essence. This must evidently be the case as regards everything the existence of which is due to some cause. Its existence is an element superadded to its essence. But as regards a being whose existence is not due to any cause, God alone is that being, for his existence, as we have said, is absolute. Existence and essence are perfectly identical. He is not a substance to which existence is joined as an accident, as an additional element. <coughs> now, some of you will perhaps be reminded of the uh, St. Anselm's ontological proof of the existence of God. <coughs> Anyhow, further. To that being, however, which has truly simple, absolute existence, and in which composition is inconceivable, that's really one. The accident of unity is as inadmissible as the accident of plurality. That is to say, God's unity is not an element superadded, but he is one without possessing the attribute of unity. Sounds hard. I've got to read you a little more. In our endeavor to show that God does not include a plurality, we can only say, quote, he is one. Although one and many are both terms which serve to distinguish quantity. We therefore make the subject clearer and show to the understanding the way of truth by saying he is one, but does not possess the attribute of unity. It's, unity is not something added to the substance. The substance means the underlying uh, of God or the under the what stands under, but it is intrinsic. <clears throat> In the same way we use one, in reference to God to express that there is nothing similar to him. But we do not mean to say that an attribute of unity is added to his essence. This is just over and over again. And finally, the true attributes of God have a negative sense. I'll read to you just one more passage. The negative attributes, however, are those which are necessary to direct the mind to the truths which we must believe concerning God. For on the one hand, they do not imply any plurality, and on the other, they convey to men <coughs> the highest possible knowledge of God. For example, it has been established by proof that some being must exist besides those things which can be perceived by the senses or apprehended by the mind. When we say of this being that it exists, we mean that its non-existence is impossible. And there is more to the effect that uh, what kinds of things you can say about one, in that absolutely radical sense, are negative things. What it is, but you cannot say anything of a positive nature about it, which would have the character of an attribute, because this one being is beyond all attribution. It is what it is, and it will be what it will be, <clears throat> only by virtue of its essence. I've been reading to you from the Guide for the Perplexed by Maimonides. <clears throat> That's uh, the 13th century. <clears throat> now, it, it would be interesting for somebody to consider uh, just exactly <clears throat> what is the interface or the interaction <clears throat> between this pagan philosophy and what uh, came out was, I have to tell you, that Maimonides, uh, 13th century, was an Aristotelian. <clears throat> He knew Aristotle very well. <clears throat> he was also an interpreter of Judaism to the Jews. And it could be said about Aristotle, uh, about Maimonides, that he attempted to purify and to make as reasonable 
and as respectful <clears throat> and as elevated uh, the doctrine that comes from scripture as it was possible to do and to purge the, uh, the conception of God of all those things that reduce God to the level of the perceptible things, of the things that can be simply imagined. <clears throat> now you might say that it makes very good sense for somebody attempting to explain the, the creator and the creation of the universe <clears throat> in such terms of a one which is absolutely irreducible to anything else. I don't have to tell you that somebody who is glossing on one <clears throat> from the point of view of scripture might make scripture intelligible must somehow or other take account of the fact that the one God <clears throat> is an agent, is a creator, is a doer, and is even a prescriber of uh, the law of the difference between good and evil. Well, you might, you might say, therefore, <clears throat> that what somebody like Maimonides had as his task was to develop a doctrine of the one that had a human meaning which distinguishes between the noble and the base, <clears throat> as Socrates' doctrine of the ideas does, and as Parmenides found objectionable because it was not sufficiently radical. Uh, perhaps one might say that at least according to Maimonides, the true understanding or the true purpose of the Old Testament <clears throat> was to bring the doctrine of one, of the absolute unity of the <coughs> primary principle of the whole into the human arena with the intention of making that one not only the explanation that you would find in physics and metaphysics, but also the explanation that you would find <clears throat> in a doctrine of morality, of human goodness. Now, uh, where does this leave Socrates? I told you to begin with that the Parmenides is a, is, this, uh, is a demonstration on the part of Parmenides of how to conduct an, an investigation. Well, maybe I didn't tell you, but that's what it is. But mm -hmm. Parmenides is persuaded to show Socrates how to investigate a philosophic question. See, young men, you don't keep promising and so forth, but you still don't know how to do it, you're under the influence of non-philosophy. And then he says, well, you show me how. And Parmenides says, well, all right. <clears throat> and then the rest of the dialogue is that. Now what happens? <clears throat> how well is Socrates instructed? As far as we know, Socrates never abandoned the orthodoxy of the doctrine of the ideas. He persisted in that particular mode of reducing a multiplicity to a unity that left the unities themselves in a state of some multiplicity. <clears throat> Socrates, of course, totally rejected the, the doctrine of uh, Protagoras, which is uh, enucleated in the Maxim, all is flux, contrave, <clears throat> all is flux, and man is the measure. Pythagoras was no lightweight, and he's given his due, but, uh, but that's unacceptable. <clears throat> For Pythagoras is a doctrine that would make it impossible, according to Socrates, Greek and Theophilus, uh, would make it impossible for us to even speak to each other and be meaningful, because everything is flux speaker and is spoken about would all be in a state of motion. <clears throat> well, Socrates somehow stands between the extreme of Protagoras of the flux doctrine on the one hand and the, the radical uh, uh, reductionism of Parmenides on the other. <clears throat> but there are things that Socrates says in various places in the Platonic corpus which make it quite clear that the doctrine of the ideas is uh, to some extent a myth. And the ideas are to some extent a human construction. They are not simply something that exists for law, but they are to some extent a human construction. I would put it this way, <clears throat> that Socrates insists that whatever is said about the whole, what is said to the human beings, has somehow or other to be good for the human beings. 
uh, in the first place, I believe the song of the, I, I would call it the song of the ideas. The song he sings about the ideas that incorporates the nobility of the, the true, the good, the beautiful, the just, the highest things and the best things. <clears throat> and he relates those to the possibility of our understanding, of, of the working of the mind, of the possibility of philosophy, and even of the possibility of intelligible human discourse. <clears throat> but for Socrates, somehow the good of the human beings takes precedence of what you might call the metaphysical uh, rigidity or reductionism of, of Parmenides' uh, uh, <clears throat> search for the absolutely primordial. And in the second place, there is what I call the song of the soul. <clears throat> Socrates' song of the soul. I call it that because in the Phaedo, where Socrates is dying, he's about to drink the hemlock, <clears throat> and he's talking to his friends. And he is uh, arguing the immortality of the soul. And he argues it this way, and he argues it that way, and there are three, at least three distinct uh, demonstrations of the immortality of the soul. And in the end, but not only in the end, Socrates says, this is a song that we have to sing to ourselves. And he's singing it to himself, as well as admonishing them to sing it to themselves, uh, because otherwise, uh, bad things like despair. <clears throat> and there is a very good reason for his both doing his best to demonstrate the verity of the doctrine of the immortality of the soul, and at the same time, and anybody can read this, uh, conceding that it is in a very important respect a song that the human beings have to sing to themselves. And you might remember, by the way, that it's uh, during his imprisonment that Socrates takes to writing, uh, writing anything, and uh, also writing uh, poetry. <clears throat> and in the Platonic Corpus itself, it said that uh, philosophy is the highest kind of poetry. And I think Socrates comes forward to us as the man who somehow found a way to articulate the demands of, if you like, uh, metaphysics and physics on the one hand, <coughs> and the requirements of the human condition, that exactly the difference between the base and the noble never be overridden by the demands of what you might call uh, pure theory. <coughs> Especially the human beings being in the condition of what, what uh, we might call the uh, denizens of the age of, the age of suits, uh, the story of <clears throat> in, in the statesman of uh, the age of Cronus and the age of Zeus. <laughs> the age of Zeus, our age, is the time in which the world is not supervised by, <clears throat> by a providential God, but uh, the God was el elsewhere. Now, <clears throat> uh, one, one last thing that I'd like to uh, put before you, uh, and, and this is really, by the way, sort of a, sort of a, a epilogue or <clears throat> when you can, I, I've introduced the subject of the Old Testament, <clears throat> or of the scriptural God, and I think that if you reflect on the, the burden of the Parmenides and the effect it did have and the effect it did not have on Socrates, <clears throat> I think it's probably fair to speculate uh, along this line. The Old Testament <clears throat> has, I think, it's fair to say, this is a hard thing to be dogmatic about, and I'm not, but I think it's fair to say of the Old Testament, it, its overriding principle is the unity of God. <clears throat> and you know, when, when uh, Jews went to their martyrdom in the 20th century or any other time, the last thing they said, Dear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, the last word they would have said. <coughs> now, uh, <coughs> the New Testament, <coughs> the transition from the old dispensation to the new dispensation. I wonder if you would want to reflect on this. <coughs> Obviously, make it as obvious from the point of view of Trinitarian Christianity, the absoluteness of the doctrine of one <coughs> must have given me give a precedence to something else, give away to something else. Interesting question. 
exactly is what. Now I know that it's, it's quite conventional to say <clears throat> that Jesus said, I mean, that he came not to destroy the law, but to perfect it. And so it's quite often said that the meaning of the Christian dispensation is really <clears throat> to emancipate man from the bondage to mere prescription. You know, don't worry about the person that you're eating with. That is to say, don't make such a thing about the dietary laws. Don't worry about the formalities. Be more worried about the purity of your heart. And, and I know that this is well said about the transition from the old to the new dispensation. But maybe unduly under the influence of these pagan info, uh, uh, readings, <clears throat> I wonder if this is worth considering. When Parmenides says to, Plato, to, uh, to Socrates, your doctrine of the ideas puts the highest in such a condition of remoteness from the human that the divine can take no notice of the human and the human can have no cognizance of the divine of such things as are really truly intelligible. I wonder if that doesn't express a, a, a problem for humanity in all conditions. How are we related to the divine? You know that in Greek mythology, <clears throat> the, the gods take human forms, they come to the human beings, they mingle with them, they uh, mix in their affairs, they mix with them in, in very corporeal ways. <clears throat> the gap between the divine and the human is overcome in that pagan way in the stories that we call mythology. But I think that that mythology represents a very deep human need <clears throat> somehow to overcome the sense that we're lost in the world and that the gods or God can take no gods and practice themselves because of the absoluteness of the difference between the human and the divine or the eternal and that which comes into being and passes away. <clears throat> Christianity solves that problem. God becomes man <clears throat> and the bridge is erected between that which is highest <clears throat> and that which is human. In a way, it's, it is akin to the, uh, to the animus, it seems to me, of Socrates, <clears throat> who does not want the gap to open up between the highest and the human in such a way <clears throat> that the two have no contact with one another. I'm not trying to suggest that, uh, that uh, the, the, the wisdom of scripture is anticipated by the wisdom of pagans or anything like that. I'm simply thinking out loud with you and trying to get some hold on what are these, uh, these perplexities, these conundrums that the human beings face. What ultimately explains us? What can be its character? What is its relation to the difference between good and evil? <clears throat> and ultimately, how do we stand, we human beings, in relation to anything that could be called absolutely divine? Thank you. that you uh, describe when you talk about the difference between Socrates and Parmenides, um, the taking into account of the moral and the human, and when you describe the doctrine of the ideas as a kind of song that we must sing to ourselves, and then again what you said about the mediation of mythology at the end. All of that seems to me a wonderful, but also in some ways very fragile position. Because I can imagine two ways of saying, ah, kind of rationalist, platonic account, an anti-poetic account, which anti-poetic poetry is of Plato. You're talking about es exoteric speech. He doesn't really mean it, it's just there to make us feel better. And the other way one could sort of, that'd be a kind of reduction of what you said. And one could also go the other way, I guess, and say, 
Well, uh, this really sounds like uh, creation of horizons. It really sounds like a kind of Nietzschean poetry. And then your position would be, in a way, reduced on either side. And I'd like very much to be in the middle, uh, if I understand you. Could you say something about how the human perspective, the human need, is not merely a need, but has a real dignity beyond just being something that makes us feel better or that we need to operate in? Well, first of all, I think I want to uh, express a reservation about the expression merely feel better. There are a lot of different reasons for not feeling good. And sometimes people who don't feel good are very sick. Sometimes people who don't feel good have a hangover. Now, I'm talking about the situation in which it isn't simply true that people don't feel good, but they don't feel good for, for a very, very serious reason. Thinking people who <coughs> contemplate the world and our place in it, who feel distress, not for some vagrant reason, but because they have, or think they have, a reason for considering themselves to be abandoned. I don't mean personally, I mean all of us. As if we really are alone in the world, there's nothing looking out for us. <clears throat> there's nothing authoritative telling us unambiguously what's the difference between good and evil. And as a matter of fact, even by some reckoning or in some dispensation, threatening us if we try to find out for ourselves. <clears throat> Maybe I should just eliminate that from the record, I mean that last, because that, that's not part of the problem, that's part of the solution. But uh, what about that? I mean, isn't it possible that somebody who perceives at least as clearly as Nietzsche the uh, problematic character of our natural matrix <clears throat> sees at least as clearly, would nevertheless <clears throat> try to remedy the human situation so far as human beings can do it, and to propose a, uh, a, an image of the world <clears throat> which is true, which is at the same time consoling, which is regulatory, <clears throat> which is salutary, and which it has to be said is projected onto the human scene by somebody who knows the degree to which and the sense in which it has to be something that we say to ourselves because we simply cannot know the truth of the alternative. Now, uh, I, I take your point. I mean, I think that what you say about in, in, invoking Nietzsche is absolutely apt. <clears throat> and yet, when you, you think about a platonic formulation, I mean, you think about the Phaedo type, it, it, it's, it's indescribably wonderful. You don't come away with the sense of, of depression or of, uh, anomie or of, uh, demoralization. And you surely don't come away with some sense that our salvation lies in the uh, <clears throat> universalization of, uh, of an aggressive spirit. Now maybe this isn't absolutely faithful to all of nature, but uh, the blind and so forth and so on. I mean, I'm not making it up, you know it. Perfectly. I don't know, why does one come away from reading the Phaedo <clears throat> feeling so different from how one comes away from reading uh, the genealogy of morals? Uh, there's no question about Nietzsche's intelligence. Uh, but he isn't as good for people. I'm sorry, I mean, that's how it appears to me. He's not as good for people as uh, Socrates was. And, uh, if, uh, and I've got to say <clears throat> that yeah, when you raise the question of this, is this mere exotericism, 
it would be mere exotericism as distinguished from exotericism simply if it's exotericism or concealed. But this is an exoteric exotericism under which is a deeper esotericism. Now, I seem to be mumbling here, <laughs> it's not simply because of the lateness of the hour, uh, but because, uh, as far as I know, there isn't any other way to put it. When Socrates says in so many words, you know, that this is a song that we have to sing to ourselves, uh, and he insists on singing it, he really does convince a lot of people. I mean, I don't have to tell you how many people really do believe that in the Phaedo, Socrates demonstrates the immortality of the soul. And the whole thing that goes with it. The goodness of the life lived thereafter. The rewards and punishments. The whole marvelous, marvelous stories. But it's, uh, it's a poem. Uh, I don't know if this is relevant, but but I think that's the case. Thank you. Uh, this is, um, you made a comment earlier when you were talking about the connection between the harmonies and the public. I was not sure if you came back to that or not. Uh, no, I did. Okay, so I have a question that is an elaboration of just a straightforward question what the connection is. Um, uh, as far as I understand, uh, what happened to Socrates from the time he was a young man and uh, it seems as if there was a change in his activity which included um, the criticism both of uh, the pre-Socratic philosophers and his philosophical predecessors and his own activity as a man. And uh, this is talked about both the apology of the Belfort story and also, um, again, the Theo, where he describes disappointment as what he was earlier and philosophizing. And I'm just wondering, what you have to say about the terms of speeches, especially about the terms of the question of justice, um, as part of his philosophic activity. Um, in ways to raise questions about political philosophy, which we certainly seem not to be present in your politics. Oh, well, we'd be here a long time if I tried to tell you about all the things that were not present in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if I could, if I understand the question well enough to be able to say something about it. Uh, what happened to Socrates in the course of his philosophical life that, uh, what, that, uh, that turned his attention to these other kinds of questions from the ones that are uh, being brooded about in the Parmenides, is that part of it now? Yeah, that is part of it. Mm -hmm. well, I guess my question is, why, why is the question of what is justice or central question um, in his later activity, which seems to be part of the critique of his earlier activity, given kind of activity of thinking about the ideas that you see in Parmenides? Well, he does say, after all, <coughs> uh, he, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, he says in the video, when he was interested in philosophy and the way in which his predecessors, as you rightly say, were all interested. I mean, they were natural natural philosophers, every one of them. Now, Parmenides, it, uh, Parmenides does an interesting thing. I don't want to get sidetracked, but I just mentioned <coughs> Parmenides introduces the notion of justice in a, in a passage that I'm, that I'm going to read here. But, uh, so it was obviously important to him to and uh, Parmenides also makes an, an effort <coughs> to articulate or integrate a, a notion of justice in his otherwise purely metaphysical and physical uh, philosophy. The way in which he does it, I think, <coughs> is by suggesting that there is a principle of justice in the articulation of all things. Some of the other pre-Socratic philosophers make that more clear. And I would say, just for example, <coughs> for everything that comes into being, something has to pay the price, 
pass away. For every little lion cub that gets fed, some little antelope has to lose its life. I mean, this quick little quote. Anything that happens, happens as a, anything that comes into being, comes into being at the expense of something else. The other side of which is nothing comes into being out of nothing. See, that is great fun enemies. Nothing comes into being out of nothing. There is, in other words, a principle of, uh, I might also remind you of King Lear, but let's not, you know, get into that. <laughs> you know, nothing begets nothing when his daughters are talking to him. People have found metaphysics in that part of King Lear. Never mind that. Uh, there is a principle of justice apparently in the Constitution of the whole. <coughs> this and that. Now so Socrates reports of himself, and he rightly referred to the freedom, that when he was a young man, he was interested in the, uh, the explanation of the whole and the way in which people were. He found it unsatisfactory. <coughs> in other words, he found the reduction of the whole to the action of matter on matter to be unsatisfactory. There were things that he could not understand that way. Maybe justice, maybe beauty, whatever it is, whatever. And also, he couldn't understand why this thing met that thing, stuck to it, in order to form a force. I mean, that it happens, all right. But why does it happen? And what is a horse? He needed to understand that. But you know the story. He came across a popular book by Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras said, all is loose. <clears throat> Mine. Socrates says of himself, he thought that was the answer. He uh, finally found a man who really got beyond that hurt and explained in terms of something intelligible rather than something really perceptible in the mind. Well, then he realized that Anaxagoras was not rigorous and contradicted his own principle and so on and so on, you know, that whole story. And, and he realized that uh, he, Socrates, would have to go his own way. That's when the so-called second sailing took place. <clears throat> second sailing is, I believe, a mistranslation or a misunderstanding of the expression. Euderos plus could mean second sailing, but it, all you have to do is to look up in Liddell and Scott and you'll see that it doesn't particularly mean, it does mean that, but that's irrelevant in, the sec, in, this, in this particular context. What it means is, if you set out in a boat with a sail on it and the wind fails, you've got to row. It's the second best way of going second best way of going. It's not the second time you set out. See? It's another example of Socrates and maybe Plato's uh, concession <clears throat> to the famous second best. Now, think about the, the Republic and the um, political description that's inherent in it. <clears throat> the political description that's inherent in it is guided by uh, justice. Uh, <clears throat> he wants to know what's justice to begin with. Very hard to see. It's a very little thing when seen in a human being that is in a soul. Let's look at it blown up and projected on the wall. Hey, look at justice in the city. And you'll see the tripartition of the city, which corresponds to the tripartition of the soul mind leading to moss and arrows and the whole whatever and all of that and all of embodied in classes of human beings educated with the whole thing. The best regime, everybody knows the story of the best regime. <coughs> how long does it last? We don't know how long it lasts. We also know it may never come into being. Somebody is shrewd enough to ask him whether it's impossible. And Socrates squirms around a bit. <coughs> And uh, answers, I think, to the effect, well, totally impossible. I mean, you can say anything is totally impossible. But uh, you might as well forget about it as the substance of the, uh, the answer. And then it is uh, uh, assumed to have an existence. And it doesn't last very long. 
Yeah, I'm always reminded when I go to the Republic at this point, I'm reminded of the Hebrew kingdom. Let's put a couple of monarchies and that's all. You know? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I mean, the real Hebrew kingdom, then it was Israel, Judah, and all the rest of the calamities. But, uh, you know, as one, very shortly. What's the Republic to a large extent about as a book on political philosophy and a book on regimes? It's a story about the decay of the regimes through a whole succession, getting worse and worse, more or less, and uh, with a prefiguration of the, uh, the uh, six-part uh, categorization of the regimes in, uh, in uh, the Aristotle's politics. So again, there's a good question. How much of the best regime story is something that is told to us, not because it's untrue, it's not untrue, but what relevance does it have, what bearing does it have, <clears throat> uh, other than as a kind of song that we might sing to ourselves. And how many regimes can anybody now enumerate uh, <clears throat> in which either a king has become a philosopher or a philosopher has become a king? Anybody know of any? Uh, Sometimes James I was called the wisest fool in England. No, 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 in the world, or some other flattering uh, epithet like that. And, well, that's not a philosopher. Uh, where has the rest of that philosopher come? I suppose the reason that these people ask the question, the young man, you know, was very genuine. Does that detract anything from the word? of the song of the best regime, which as far as I know, people don't generally describe as a song, but since I'm doing it in its mode, let me give you a uh, No, I think it might be a bit, uh, I mean, maybe the question is absolutely apt. <coughs> how does how the Republic in any way fit into this schema of the, uh, the Socratic restraint and moderation? confronting the ambiguous critical world, and I think uh, it very well does. John? <coughs> well, I want to see if, if I'm on the right track with the type of people that I'm on. Um, I'm, I'm uh, tempted to think by what you said that in Parmenides, then, you actually see um, Socrates having the experience that he describes later in his trial as the turn, as his turn to begin to think, that something like this, that lest he become like Antiphon, it's necessary for him to find another way of doing, uh, of thinking about the whole. Uh, he, uh, <coughs> he, Socrates, started before the conversation <coughs> with Parmenides. He simply started with this doctrine of ideas, <coughs> which uh, projected a multiplicity of these unities of the ideas. <coughs> I don't think he ever abandoned that. I think that whatever happened in the course of the dialogue, he persisted in that uh, that notion now, either as, <clears throat> as a truth or as a song is a different question. <clears throat> I think maybe well, I was wondering whether the experience of, of his encounter with Parmenides might have persuaded him that what he thought was simply true had instead to be understood as a kind of necessary song. You mean because of the, the power of Parmenides' uh, reservations of that participation? Yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, all of uh, us <clears throat> Well, that, that's a, a, an absolutely useful and sensible uh, a question. I, I don't know the answer to it. <clears throat> the question is whether Socrates, although he persisted in the doctrine of the many ideas of the multiple uh, manifold of ideas that he persisted in it in a different spirit after 
hearing Carmen is out than before <coughs> because he realized afterwards that uh, it wasn't so much that the doctrine of ideas was true, as that it was necessary. Something like that. I, uh, yeah, that's what I suggested. But I mean, uh, why did that suggestion from what you said it surprises me that you reacted to my question the way that you are? I said, it's my suggestion. <laughs> uh, I thought it was what you were doing. <coughs> well, what I what I had in mind by the, the second way of sailing <coughs> really proceeds from things that occurred uh, later in the experience of Socrates <coughs> and had perhaps. Uh, but I I think I'm going to have to think about that <coughs> because. If what I have been suggesting is valid, namely <clears throat> that uh, that this reductionism of Parmenides is not humanly beneficial, <clears throat> then Socrates might really have had to put his mind to the question: Well, isn't it really true that a doctrine that explains the whole, which ought to be beneficial for the human beings, whatever else it is, uh, should include something that uh, reinstalls the needs of the human beings in what you might call the <coughs> metaphysics of the cosmology. And, uh, <clears throat> well, you know, I, now that I think about it in response to a very good suggestion, I think one might even say of Maimonides that uh, that's what happened. Uh, the doctrine of the entirety, the doctrine of the one, of the one as the absolute, irreducible, inexplicable, and to that extent mysterious uh, essence of the whole, <clears throat> which nevertheless carries with it a, a, uh, a doctrine that's humanly beneficial, uh, and even or especially from the point of what the needs of human beings <coughs> who cannot derive uh, definitive morality or rule of life from nature alone. <coughs> um, uh, I wasn't uh, asking about the Republic um, or about the Indian-Dutch regime um, so much. I wasn't interested in the, 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 the song-like aspects of the Republic, but I was more interested in the question of justice as a serious philosophical question in the heart of Socrates' um, new way of philosophizing. I was uh, curious if you, know, you, you did suggest that from any thought quite a bit about justice, but it seems as if it takes a central place in Socrates' thought perhaps is a preliminary for further thought, but is a very important and a very difficult preliminary question. I'm thinking more of book one or book one of the Republic rather than books two and one. Yeah, but you better think of books two and one. Well, I think about that too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. Yeah, so the, the, well, let me try again and see whether I understand it. <clears throat> what accounts for the primacy of the, the issue of what is just uh, for Socrates? For Socratic philosophy as opposed to pre-Socratic philosophy or philosophy of his philosophical predecessors. Oh, well, I, I mean, I think that the, the formulaic answer to that question is exactly that Socrates understood <clears throat> that an account of all things, an account of the whole, that does not include in an absolutely serious way an account of the difference between good and ill of human beings. And the ground of that distinction is a defective uh, and imperfect uh, attack on the whole, as an imperfect the rest of the whole. I would not be prepared to say that justice is at the center of Socrates' concern. Uh, I don't know where exactly to put it. Uh, 
that it's important for him in a sense that the, the human things are important for him. That, that's what he says, you know, that at first he studied the, the natural philosophy and so forth. And then he uh, began to study the, the human things. And I have to look again, but it, you know, it might just be that when he began to think about the human things and the human good, in the context of what he knew or thought he knew about the whole, he began to realize maybe that, that there is something to the story of the transition from the age of Cronus to the age of Zeus. That is to say, <clears throat> the doctrine of the statesman, in the statesman, to the effect that we're, we're not under divine supervision and that nature leaves us with mixed signals about the good. And uh, that being true, or believing that that's true, it behooves a man to think very carefully about what possible ground could be found for <clears throat> distinguishing just from unjust. And, uh, and if he could find that in the constitution of the soul itself, well, all the better. But I think by now, I'm pretty much given out. <laughs>